Good morning, Berean. <laughs> We're continuing our series in the book of Galatians. And let me start off with this question. When you're in a church listening to a message, do you like listening to like straight doctrine or do you like listening to a story that has lessons behind it? I'd probably get different answers in this group. Someone said both. Guess what? That's a good answer, both. Because Paul today, as he's speaking to the Galatians in this letter, he's going to use doctrine, and he's also going to use an illustration to prove his point. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be starting with verse 21. Paul has been in doctrine in chapters 3 and 4. He's talking about the great doctrine of justification, freedom in Jesus Christ. And as Tony mentioned, these, these Judaizers, they're the problem right now. Everybody say, boo, Judaizers, boo, boo. They're the bad guys. Because Paul went in in his missionary trips. The first time he went in with Barnabas. Second missionary trip, he took Silas. He established these churches in Galatia, and the churches were growing. And as soon as he ended the second missionary trip, this group moved in, these Judaizers. And they were saying, hey, it's Jesus Christ is, you need more than Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ is okay, but you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law of Moses. And Paul was saying, no, no. Jesus Christ is enough. Faith in Jesus Christ is all you need. And Paul is writing this book, and he is he's mad. Paul is upset. That's why the, the last verse Tony read, I am perplexed about you. I wish I could change my tone, but I am upset that you're falling for these false teachers in the church. I want you to experience the freedom, the liberty we have in Jesus Christ, and you want to be enslaved by the law of Moses. So let me read the first section here this morning, starting with verse 21. I'm going to read to verse 26 of Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but the son by the free woman was born as the result of divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem as above is free and she is our mother. And all the God's people said, what? Huh? Huh? You know, sometimes you read scripture and you read a section and you read it and you go, what does that mean? So what do you do? You just give up and ah. no, you pray about it. Number one, you pray for that. The Holy Spirit would help illuminate this passage of scripture. And then you dig into it and you do some research and our purpose this morning is, let's take a look at this passage of Scripture. What is this, what is this Scripture really saying? Now, it talks a lot about Hagar and Sarah. So let's, a quick review in the book of Genesis. And I'm going to go through this quickly. You don't need to look here. You know, Genesis 12, the Lord came to Abraham. And says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you land and many descendants. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by you. In Genesis 15, 
God comes and promises Abraham a son. And the, the famous verse in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now in Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah, they're getting old and they have no kids yet. They know the promise, but they're getting up in age and they're getting a little anxious. And Sarah comes to Abraham one day and says, I got an idea. We're getting old. There's no kids. I have an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Why don't you go sleep with her and we'll build a family through her? Bad idea. Bad idea. Husbands, if you're out there, if your wife ever tells you she has an Egyptian slave, don't, don't, don't go down this road. Nothing good is going to come from this. this. This is not, and they lived happily ever after type of story. That's not this type of story. Here, Sarah, besides suggesting a very immoral act, she was rushing God's timing. Rushing way ahead of God's timing. And she was determined, though, to have this family. So she said, Abraham, go sleep with my slave. Well, eventually he did. And soon, Hagar is expecting. Pretty soon, there is a conflict between Hagar and Sarah. Who saw that one coming, right? Who saw that one? Of course there's going to be a conflict. And Sarah complained to Abraham. And Abraham gave her permission to mistreat Hagar. Hagar then fled. She just fled. And on her way fleeing, the Lord stopped her and said, Hagar, I, I see what you're going through. In fact, this is a great name for, for God here. El Roy, the, the God, the living God who sees. He sees. So God saw her dilemma and says, I'm going to make a nation out of your son. I'm going to make, there's going to be many descendants from your son that you're going to have. Go back and submit to Sarah. So she went back and she ended up having Ishmael. She ended up having Ishmael. Abraham was 86 at the time. In Genesis 17, we see that now Abraham is 99. Sarah is 90. And little Ishmael is 13 years old. And the Lord comes and says, the son's coming. In fact, next year at this time, Sarah, you're going to have a baby boy. Wow, can you imagine that? Genesis 21, baby Isaac is born. Ishmael is 13 years old. He starts mocking baby Isaac, starts mocking him. He's concerned because the inheritance usually goes to the elder son, but he's a little concerned at this time at all the special treatment that little Isaac is getting. And, of course, he starts mocking, and Sarah again goes to Abraham. Says, Abraham, I, I mean, uh, we got this uh, Ishmael mocking. We need to get rid of them. And, of course, Abraham is distressed because Ishmael was his son. But the Lord said, listen to your wife. So, eventually, they kicked Hagar and Ishmael, and they left. And, of course, the Lord once again came to Hagar and says, a nation will come from Ishmael. But the Lord also came to Abraham and says, it's through your son Isaac. It's through your son Isaac that nations will be blessed. And, of course, the Messiah would come from the line of Isaac. So we have two women here that represent two covenants. 
And I, I sort of have it this way up on the board here. I, I sort of think as athletic teams. So we have uh, Team Hagar. I'm going to call it Team Hagar. And here's some of the words associate, associated with Hagar in this section. Slave, enslaved, the law, uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia, Ishmael, flesh, present day Jerusalem at that time. Jer Jerusalem at that time. Let's take a look at Team Sarah. Team Sarah, free, freedom, the promise, Isaac, born by the power of the Spirit, the future Jerusalem from above. Paul is going to ask the Galatians now, which team do you want to be on? Team Hagar or Team Sarah? Matt, what team do you want to be on? Good answer, Matt. Smart man. Smart man. So, yeah, we, we want to be on Team Sarah. And let's, now that we have that information, let's go back and reread that section that we just got done with. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. And I think it will make a lot more sense now as we read this section. Let's start with verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. By the way, just a small side note here. Later on, years later, Sarah would die and Abraham would take on another wife, Katera, and, and there would be some other children born, but they have nothing to do with, with the story. We're just talking about the Ishmael and Isaac. Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, Hagar, and the other by the free woman, Sarah. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. There is nothing unusual about the birth of Ishmael. It was a biological birth, male and female, birds and bees. You know, it's... But when you take a look, it says here, um, but the son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. That was a miraculous birth. I mean, Romans 4.19 says, talking of Abraham, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So the birth of Isaac was a very miraculous, divine birth promised by God. You and I, when we think of our spiritual birth, that we're children of God, that we've been adopted into God's family, you would have to say that's a miraculous birth. Just looking back at the whole that God would take on flesh and come down and Jesus was born in, in such a miraculous way and his whole ministry, his death, his resurrection. And by having faith in him, we're adopted into God's family. That's a very divine promise and very miraculous. Let's take a look at verse 24. These things are being taken figuratively. So this is an allegory that Paul is using to present his lesson. These women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai. Where, was, where did Moses get the Ten Commandments from? Mount Sinai. And bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar sta uh, stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Twice 
in Genesis, Hagar flees to the area of Arabia. History tells us that her descendants are going to populate the area of Arabia. The current city of Jerusalem at that time was under bondage. Politically, they were under bondage to Rome. Spiritually, they were under bondage to the law, to Judaism. Of course, Jerusalem was a sacred city held in high esteem. Jerusalem was a center. They were enslaved to the law, spiritually and politically, to Rome. So that's where you see the slavery. Now, in contrast, let's go back to team Sarah, verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Looking ahead to the future days, biblically, and what a great description we have in Revelation 21 of the future Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. Let me read a, a few verses in Revelation chapter 21 with verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. This is the future Jerusalem, the free Jerusalem from above that is connected with Team Sarah. Remember, we want to be on Team Sarah. That's our team in this section. And that's what Paul writing to the Galatians. Be on Team Sarah, not Team Hagar. Verse 27. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who, never, who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. This is a prophecy from Isaiah 54.1. Isaiah was a prophet who was trying to warn Israel of their sinful ways. And they didn't listen to Isaiah. And Judah was taken into captivity, into Babylon. But there was the hope and the promise that someday they would come out of bondage, out of slavery, and that they would return. While they were in bondage, they were like a barren woman. Back then in biblical days, if a woman could not have children, it was a very shameful thing. And this is a double prophecy because Isaiah is not only talking about returning from Babylon to Jerusalem, he's also talking about the future and that a group of people will be freed from legalism, from the law, from Team Hagar, and will experience freedom in Jesus Christ and the descendants, the children of God, is going to be a large number of people that we will occupy the new Jerusalem. So it really helps when you know the context here as you go through these verses, and it makes a lot more sense. Let's go 
to verse 28 of Galatians 4. Now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. When little Isaac was born, Ishmael persecuted him, mocked him. And Sarah went to Abraham and says, get rid, get rid of Hagar. Get rid of Isaac. They're persecuting us. What's going on currently here? Here the apostle Paul is being persecuted. He's being persecuted by the Judaizers. The Ju Judaizers are undermining all of his ministry. And they're going around and telling the people, don't listen to Paul, don't listen to Paul. And, and Paul and his associates went through a lot of persecution. The early church went through a lot of persecution. There's persecution today. This was, the persecution was coming from the camp that believed that were enslaved to the law and they wanted to get rid of Paul. Grace people and law people can't coexist. It's hard. It's very hard for grace people and law people. Sarah and Hagar had a hard time living together without conflict. And it's the same way today. It's been said that the best revival that you can have in the church is sometimes called a reverse revival. Do you know what a reverse revival is? Some, some people believe that the best way to revive a church is you need to get rid of some people in the church before the church can prosper. Because you cannot have wrong theology and correct theology in the same church. Bad doctrine and, and wrong doctrine. I really believe the future church the ch or the, the current church, the challenge is speaking the truth and love. There is, there is so much bad doctrine out there, so much bad theology. And speaking the truth in love, speaking God's truth and standing firm in God's word is the way to revival. Not giving in to bad doctrine. Adrian Rogers, pastor, author, uh, he's been president of the Southern Baptist Convention, has a saying. It is better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. You understand that? Better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. Sarah, Hagar could not coexist. And we need to be strong. We need to stand firm in our convictions, God's word is our authority and stand strong in that area. So the question that Paul is giving to the Galatian church, the question is, is not who's your daddy? Because Abraham was the dad in both, right? The question is, who's your mother? You like the little Dr. Seuss thing? Okay. It's who's your mother? Are you from Sarah's camp or are you from Hagar's camp? You have to choose. And what was so frustrating for Paul is the Galatia church, they were Christians. They, they had received the Lord. They had faith in God. And, and now they were going back to Team Hagar. They, they wanted to be enslaved again. 
in legalism, in the law. And that was frustrating to Paul. We're going to just dip a little bit into chapter 5 this morning. Ray Pritchard, one of my resources, says, you have to get the gospel right. Because if you don't get the gospel right, two bad things are going to happen. Sinners are not going to be saved. And number two, God's not going to be glorified. So you have to get the gospel right. He goes on to explain that if, if Galatians was like a sermon, chapters one and two is like the introduction. Chapters three and four is the body of the message. That's where he goes into justification. Chapters five and six is the application. How to experience freedom in Christ and Christian liberty. So let's take a look here. Chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. and Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Let's continue reading. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be sacrificed that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you are trying to be justified by the law, have been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. For, though the, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Paul to the Galatians. If you want to go back into legalism, Christ doesn't have much value to you then. And if they want you to start with circumcision, it might seem like an innocent. I mean, the Jewish people, they were used to circumcision. But a large portion of the church was Gentiles. If you accept their advice and if you become circumcised, then the next thing that they're going to want you to do is follow the rest of the laws. They're going to want you to follow other dietary laws they're, they're going to want you to observe all the special days. That they might want you to start bringing animal sacrifices to the temple. It's just going to go on and on and on and on. And pretty soon, you're going to be trapped and enslaved following a list of rules. So don't even start. Don't even go in that direction. Because once you start keeping the law, you have an obligation to keep the whole law. Again, going back to Ray Pritchard, he said one day he has three sons. They were smaller, and he was in charge of them one day. So he says, like a good dad, I was inside the house watching TV. And the three sons went out in the backyard. Pretty soon, he hears a great big smash. And here comes his three sons running into the house with a very scared look on their face. What the three sons did is they got their dad's golf clubs from the garage, which they weren't supposed to touch. They got some golf balls that they were hitting away from the house, but one young boy did a terrible slice or something, and the ball came, and he had a back door, a big window panel door. And the golf ball went through the bottom portion of it. So as they went out to inspect the door, here the whole bottom right quarter was smashed in. And he said his son had the nerve to say, Dad, I'm sorry, but most of the window is still okay. <laughs> most of the window is okay. But you know what? Because one part of it is smashed, the whole window is smashed. Am I correct? And that's what the law is like. To keep the law, you have to keep it perfectly. 
If you stumble in one point, in fact, James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So to get entangled in the law and having that burden, Paul is just, to the churches of Galatia, why do you want that? You are free. Free in Christ. And not, and we always say this every week, with freedom comes responsibility. That doesn't mean that you just go out and sin on purpose. That's not what Paul wants. You're not, you've heard it said, you're not sinless, but you want to sin less, but you're not sinless. But there's that freedom in Jesus Christ. You know, when the, Lord comes again, and as you watch the news, Lord, come quickly, right? When the Lord comes again, our hope is our faith is in the Lord. We trust him. Do you think the first question that the Lord's going to ask us is, hey, have you been circumcised? Have you been following the law? No, he's not going to ask that. Really, the Lord doesn't care. Paul is saying here, the Lord doesn't really, if you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it's no big deal with the Lord. It's have you put your hope and your trust in him? Now, of course, we're told here in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, is expressing itself through love. And as Christians, we need to express our love. We need to forgive others as God has forgiven us, right? We need to show love to others as, as God has loved us. What a week in the news. What a week. We look at our world. People need the Lord, don't they? People need the Lord. People, people need to know the truth of God's word. They need to know that God loves them, that God has a plan of salvation for, for them, that God offers salvation. We need to be bold as Christians as we walk in the spirit of declaring truth. We need to stand guard against false teachers that are out there. There's many false teachers, like the Judaizers, that would want us lead us astray. But we need to stand firm and be faithful to God's word. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the challenge from your word. I thank you that our salvation is based on faith in you. It's a gift it's by your grace. It's not by works, Lord, so that we won't boast about it. None of us deserve heaven. It's only by your grace and mercy, Lord, that we're saved. Lord, I just pray that you would protect us, that we would stand firm against any type of false teaching, bad theology that would lead us astray. Lord, help us to be students of the word and stand firm and be strong and bold witnesses for you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.